<laughs> Thank you for doing this. Um, I'm really excited because your work is pretty wild. Um, and I want to hear more about it, how, what your inspirations are and how you actually make it, you know, physically. Um, and so we're doing this conversation, Karen, because you've got an exhibition at the gallery at the moment that's just gone online and it's featuring mostly works that you made this year or in the last year. Um, and so many of them are presented for the first time. You work in um, both clay and in watercolour and um, you have a really wild range of references as well, which I guess contributes to this kind of wildness in your work and this kind of real um, very distinctive kind of aesthetic, which we can't quite place, but is also eerily familiar to us, I guess. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about your relationship with eBay, because I know eBay has a role to play in your work and the things that you make. So tell, tell me about that. Um, well, I suppose I'm a, um, it's like a guilty secret. I'm kind of quite addicted to um, playing on eBay, almost like a game. Um, like you put in a keyword and see where it leads. Um, so the keywords might be um, spotted horse. Um, I usually kind of um, keep it um, restricted to like porcelain, ceramics and pottery. Um, but sometimes that also leads down, um, if, you, if you look at somebody's a piece that might interest me um, and you look at somebody else's I and mean, you look at um, other things that they're selling you can be taken to other objects as well which sometimes can find their way into my work but so, so I, I start with like um, a keyword and um, and I just kind of go with my gut really I, I might see something that I like because of the way it's been photographed or because it resonates on a sort of emotional level um, to do with like um, memory or um, an experience or um, something that I remember from my past maybe you know like some things that I've seen in my grandma's house or um, so things like that so I just kind of um, just look and enjoy the chase and then you know if I'm lucky I find something or, or, or if I find something can leave it in my my watch list and let it incubate and then go back to it um, and in a while and and see if it still interests me and, and and kind of ask myself what what is it that interests me about it right. and sometimes i might um keep it as a photograph and maybe kind of um montage it or do something different with it or sometimes i might um buy the object if it's cheap enough mm -hmm. um sometimes um they're too expensive so i i rely on good photographs to remodel them um, so yeah, I might remake them based on the photographs from eBay or right. buy them and then remake them and then do something else with them. But it's quite an intuitive process then, like when you see an object, you just, it just has this kind of effect on you. You can't quite place what it is or why you want to, why you're attracted to that object or, or that thing. You just know that that's what you want to use to, to exactly. make. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, it's like, um, it's, it's almost like a conundrum. You know it's something there that's interesting to you, but you can't quite put your finger on it. And sometimes the, the, the answer to that, that conundrum doesn't actually happen till quite late on in the process. Um, uh, like, um, like with the piano, see, lots of the things I made was a piano series. Mm -hmm. I started off just making um, the piano with the horse on top because um, I'd seen something um, that reminded me of um, when I used to go to the um, Saturday morning cinema, uh, it was um, a Lauren and Hardy movie. And that reminded me of that experience. So I wanted to make something based on, on that. So I made the piano and um, I, I put a donkey on top rather than a horse. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was kind of taking the objects to be photographed. And at that stage, I'd only made the one piano and the one, the one donkey. Um, and then uh, I think I, 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 I removed the donkey and I put something else on there. I put the, um, the the canary on there. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because it reminds me, there's like this kind of songbird aspect to it. And then there's like the dead canary. And then there was, um, it was happening at the time of, um, uh, well, recently in the last sort of six months when um, music wasn't being played anymore, um, being played live. So that kind of resonated with me as well. So, um, 
yeah so sometimes things don't yeah it's like links are made after the pieces have, have been made right yeah the process in itself i guess reveals a lot to you and and to us the viewers about about the nature of desire and what what like attracts our impulses and you know mm. kind of i guess you assimilate in a way like the the way that our desire works as consumers as well like searching through ebay looking at things and how that kind of connects with you know the subconscious um elements aspects of desire so you know obviously sex erotica comes up a lot in your work as well and i, I really yeah. enjoy how you play with those you know the parallel between the, those two things between our desires as, as consumers and, and and our desires as as women towards you know sexuality objects also childhood yeah memories like juxtaposing all of that together it's, it's really interesting and you you really reveal as well through that process like the kind of absurdities of that you know how close those two things are and mm. obviously one of the things you often do is bring together kind of um childhood figures or things that are very twee or very sweet or could be in like a grandma's house like you say and mm. then with this kind of um s and um or, or different kind of fetishistic like sexual practices and stuff and i think that's that's one of the most um distinctive like aspects of your work let's say um tell me a little bit more about that and how um sort of sexuality comes into your work and and why um well sometimes i i, I think just by looking at the objects you can kind of see like a two-sided um, aspect to them they there's this kind of very sweetness and innocence about them and then but there's also I think especially in like the Beatrix Potter stuff there is already a very dark side to them so I suppose I'm just kind of bringing out what's already kind of under the surface and just making more of what there already is yeah so um but it's I think it's also about um, what's interesting is like the power who's who's holding the power as well in terms of um, erotica and sexuality yeah yeah and I think specifically the Beatrix Potter works I wanted to ask you about because Beatrix Potter and the illustrations of those um, you know classic childhood books um, comes in into your work um, quite a lot and we can see that in some of the the works as well from um, from recent years that are as on show as part of this exhibition. What is it specifically about Beatrix Potter? Is that something you used to um, look at and read when you were a child? And I know that you're, you know, like you say, you're kind of amplifying the darkness that you find specifically mm -hmm. in those in those books and kind of really bringing it out and then overlaying it with this sort of um, very overt sexuality that creates, an, you know, even more sort of disturbing effect are you interested in the way sort of sexuality um, well, in those things or I, I never I never read them as a child. I, I kind of grew up in a house where we had no books. So so we used to tell each other stories and they you sometimes used to become um they they started off as kind of like innocent fairy tales and then we'd kind of weave in these kind of um more sinister or more exciting um endings or scenarios into them um so i can't say i kind of um a beatrix potter resonated with me as a child but when i had my own children um they were we were given um, a box set so i kind of rediscovered them i suppose because um, i was aware of them but i'd never actually um read the stories so i was kind of reading them from afresh and read um seeing them through my children's eyes as well mm -hmm. and they, they really loved the kind of the transgression in some of the stories i mean i know um, some of the Beatrix Potters, the characters aren't brilliant in terms of like the roles women play. They're often quite subservient and which was difficult for, for me to read to my children, but they still love the, the naughtiness of them and mm -hmm. the and the telling of like um, how animals might be murdered and eaten. And so, so there was that aspect as well, which I liked. Um, well, uh, and I think um, it was rediscovering them as well as objects um, through eBay. Um, I was, I think I put a keyword in for rabbit and I, I, I came across um, the memorabilia of Beatrix Potter and um, some little bunnies that came up. And one of the ones that came up was um, uh, uh, Peter Rabbit being spanked by his uncle. And it just, it just already, you know, it was just like, that, that looks like somebody um, a little boy doing something he shouldn't 
um, well, you know, it looked like it was being exploited by his uncle, mm. um, as well as being smacked. So I just kind of um, ran with that really. And, but um, it just seemed like an obvious thing to do because I didn't want to do too much to it to, um, to, to suggest what was happening. So um, I kind of experimented with um, applying latex to the ears and um, it, it just obviously became a, a gimp mask. Yeah, so. that's the work Barney from 2014 that we're talking about, isn't it? Which is um, yes, yeah, on paper, um, and where you kind of re, um, redo, re-represent the the image, the original image, and I mean it is incredibly. I'm sort of I'm laughing because it is funny, but it's it is it's very dark and it is very scary, and I think like you're saying, children pick up on those things and react to them. And so in a way we're kind of seeing them through adult eyes yes like knowing what we know like as adults looking at those those books but i guess these two things are not disconnected right so reading reading those kind of books and and the way that things are coded like right from childhood leads us onto these things you know as adults yeah. so i like the way that you kind of use that motherhood experience as well in such a kind of twisted way what do your children think of your of your works now? Um, well, well, when I had an exhibition um, in um, the Minories when um, uh, in 19, I'm sorry, 2015, and I invited lots of friends and neighbours and they, they came with very young children. And, and I was a bit worried about how uh, my friends were going to react to seeing some of the, the imagery. Um, I, mean, I mean, there's one piece that I had on the, um, on this, um, can you see? It was on the mantelpiece, and um, it was something I found on eBay, and it's um, it's a bunny and mother. So I was worried about what my friends were going to say, but they they all came up and said, "Oh, my children really loved it. They loved the naughtiness of the the, um, the bunnies and <laughs> the uh, the play, the aspect of play, but the the transgression and the the sexual aspect as well." Because I think ch children are very aware, aware of sex. I think, um, yeah. and also there's this awful kind of um, proliferation of um, child pornography which I think um, it, it touches on yeah. which was obviously around during the time when the um, the Beatrix Potter illustrations were initially painted mm. but even more so now so yeah. that's kind of um, kind of commenting on that as well I think yeah yeah and what about your kids because um, obviously they must have read these books with you as a as a Mm. children so what do they think of your works now that they're sort of young adults um do they enjoy well, they, 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 sorry. They, they they do enjoy them yeah they think they're funny and um they can they can see um how that's that that kind of simple step from being something fairly innocent to just flipping it can make it um Re, um, be reinterpreted in a different way more contemporary yeah. way yeah so yeah, yeah. and it's often a simple thing like like you say um just adding that little detail and it you just see the image like and i think that's really at the heart of your work isn't it it's finding that um mm. quite strident images or, or striking objects that then very easily become you know topple topple over into something else and, and yeah it make you see um you know i don't think i'll be able to read Beatrix Potter to my children <laughs> in your work. Um, the title of the show is Waiting for Something Better to Come Along, which is a brilliant title. Um, I love it. Tell me how you came up with that. Well, it came from a conversation I was having with Alison and, and um, Richard. Um, we're just talking about um, preparing for the show and they asked me if I had um, any ideas for a title and I told them of the ideas I had but I wasn't completely satisfied with them and just said I'm waiting for something better to come along and then Richard kind of paused and said hey that would be a brilliant idea for a, a brilliant um, title for an exhibition and and then we all started laughing because it just seemed so perfect and and then he, um, Richard said, yes, that's very you, Karen, which I'm not really sure what he meant by that, but <laughs> it, I just loved it as well. So that's, it kind of stuck. So we went with that. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And I think it really captures something about this time. It captures something about maybe the essence of your work of just this kind of um, seriousness, but also 
silliness that's always kind of there's always that that um you know, contradiction almost in your work or those two that tension between those two things which which for me makes it so so special and so unique um so we've got in this exhibition there's a young guy sniffing glue there's some dead canaries there's cats clambering yeah. over a designer handbag another one's on a piano there's all kinds of things going on but i think one of my favorite works um from this exhibition is called flip flop um and I think for me, it really epitomizes this series of sculptures that you've made um, because it has this sort of irreverence. But underneath, you know, once you look into it and read a bit more and, and sort of spend a bit more time with this work, there's quite a gut wrenching story behind it. Um, and it's once you kind of understand yeah. fully what you're looking at, it's difficult to look at it in the same way again. And, and that's kind of what we were talking about before as well with Beatrix Potter. But tell me about that work, about, about Flip Flops and about the story and sort of how you came to make it. Okay. Um, well, I, I kind of, um, I, it's, it's like two things were happening. I was tidying up my children's toys. They don't play with them anymore. And I came across um, a Playmobil um, dinghy, um, which obviously resonated because there's so much um, on the news now of um, migrants crossing the sea to come um, come here, um, and, uh, and and at the same time I was kind of um, had this image in my head of, of a, a news item of um, a little boy, a three-year-old boy called um, Alan Curdy, who was washed up on the, the Greek coast, um, which was su such a kind of sad image of this little boy who, who had um, uh, been traveling with his parents and um, had died in the, the crossing. Um, and there was this one particular photograph of the little boy who had been foreshortened on the beach. So you saw the soles of these shoes um, first. And it just really, really kind of um, touched me, I suppose, and resonated. So, um, the, the, there was that image and then there was the, the Playmobil um, dinghy, which um, I came across. Um, so I knew I wanted to kind of remake that, um, that a, a dinghy kind of ceramic version of that. So I wasn't quite sure how I was going to approach it and what was going to happen. But I just kind of went with the making of the dinghy. Um, and I wanted to make it quite simple, like it was made like, like a Playmobil object almost. Um, and I knew that I wanted to use um, a Persian blue um, glaze, which is um, obviously kind of very sea-like, but it also kind of, um, it's uh, connected with um, um, Iran and um, the Middle East, that kind of very beautiful deep blue colour. So um, I wanted to use that. Um, and, and also I was kind of still thinking of the, the this, this sole of a, a shoe um, and um, I suppose that the flip-flop I, I kind of came came up with the idea of using a flip-flop because of its ubiquity um, its cheapness and, and also there was this image I um, or this news item I came across about Syrian children playing in the snow um, in kind of um, war-torn um, landscape wearing flip-flops so I kind of felt that there was something to be um, to, some, something to use in, in that imagery. So I, I wanted to make it in gold as well because I thought it would kind of um, kind of uh, make something very precious out of it. So um, and then I made them as two separate objects. And again, by um, just placing them together, um, it just seemed to fit and be very kind of um, complete. And, and there's something about the scale that was happening and um, it, it's still retaining the idea of a, a toy, but the, um, the size of the, um, the flip-flop was still very childlike. Yeah. So I, I just, just see, it just seemed to be very right as it was. Yeah, and I think once you understand all of that, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a simple work on first glance, but then, you know, thinking about all of those things that, that you've just mentioned um, that are sort of, in the process and in the thinking and in, uh, and actually are present in the work itself. Um, it becomes a very complex work and just our responses to it, our reaction to it as a viewer, I think you put us in a position of like almost, you know, accusing or like we, we, we are sort of these, these um, bystanders that are looking on and kind of enjoying, I guess, this, this mm. image or we respond to it thinking like, oh, that's a happy, fun thing. It reminds us maybe of holiday or that. And, and then there's that, you know, 
devastating effect when you kind of you see those little details that the size yeah. of the small and the um thinking about the colors and thinking about like you say something really precious but that is seen as turned into mm. something you know so disposable in a way um yeah. and you think of that child's body and that image obviously um is also particularly you know probably one of the defining images of our of our time crazy, yeah that really struck and accord with with everyone i think particularly as parents um mm. and in a way change the way that a lot of people think about about these issues around migration specifically why is it important to you as an artist to have that transformative effect in your work because you both physically transform objects you take them from something that they once were and make them into something else um and make them obviously into art objects but also there's this thing of um you know and you, and you you kind of persist um in your work with it of like making us look differently and the things around us and making us have that shift in our perspective but a quite a striking way why has that been something that you is so important for you to do in your work um well i think that's a, a role of the, of the artist is to um represent things so people can reevaluate things and see things in a different light um it, it's it's just about um show, showing things in a new way letting people see see things in a new way i suppose that's um, i guess that's what i do um, and that's the role of an artist i suppose i think it's something we kind of want to do naturally i think to way of re-examining re things spotlighting things and seeing a new way and hopefully with a um, bit of poetry thrown in as well <laughs> <laughs> brilliant thank you so much karen um it's so fascinating to hear about your brilliant work and um yeah everyone will enjoy the the online exhibition whilst it's running oh it's lovely to meet you